Well, that's the next thing. <laughs> okay, all right, we got it going here. All right, we want to talk about a mystery. Now, a mystery to God's people is something that is to be revealed. A mystery to everybody else is always going to be a mystery. They're never going to know it. So mysteries in the Bible means something that God tells his people. We want to look at a mystery revealed today, a mystery that was designed by God himself. And I mention that because some people think they don't need to study this subject. But if God designed it, there must be something really important about it. We'll see that the details are all important. God made an object lesson for us to study, and that object lesson contains shadows, it contains types, it contains symbols, services, rituals. Did I say rituals? No. Ceremonies, priesthood, all these different things that God has designed. It's about the person, the ministry, and the mission of Jesus. All of it. So it seems to me that if a person is a Christian, they're going to want to understand the things that God has put out there to reveal Jesus to us. How can a person say they love Jesus and then they don't want to know anything about him? <laughs> That's kind of strange, isn't it? So God has done all of this, and as we study the subject, we will see the glory of God in his self-sacrificing love. Now the reason we're studying this, not only because God has laid it out there for us to study, but we need to understand why he did that. If man had had his original powers, God could have just told him the requirements, and then man could have decided to do it or not to do it, and receive the grace of Christ and move through it. But man, when he fell, lost the powers of his mind. And so God has to say it a lot of different ways. And even then, people still have a hard time getting a hold of it. <laughs> See, with all the different things God has done to reveal who Jesus is and what his mission is. So we're going to go back up now to the ancient times to see how God revealed it and how Jesus himself dealt with it during his time on earth. In Desire of Ages, page 78, The first time I saw this, it really made me understand the importance of this subject. All right, it's right at the very first sentence of 78. That's how I wasn't able to see it here. Page 78, for the first time, the child Jesus looked upon the temple. Okay. The first time. How old was he? Twelve years old. See, the twelve-year-old child, male child, was supposed to go there for the first time, to participate, to do something in his own life, to, to now be part of the temple service. And so Jesus went for the first time at age 12. And I want to remember, you to remember with me that he was 12 years old. He saw the white-robed priests performing their solemn ministry. He beheld the bleeding victim upon the altar of sacrifice. 
with the worshipers, he bowed in prayer. While the cloud of incense ascended before God, he witnessed the impressive rites of the Paschal service. Day by day, he saw their meaning more clearly. Every act seemed to be bound up with his own life. New impulses were awakening within him. Silent and absorbed, he seemed to be studying out a great problem, the mystery of his mission was opening to the Savior. Now you see, that's what we're studying, the mystery of the mission of Christ. Well, isn't it amazing that it says right here, he had to study the same subject we're looking at to find out who he was. <laughs> he went to the sanctuary. And as he saw the bleeding victim, as he saw the ceremonies and the rites, and he saw the priest doing the thing, he realized this has something to do with me. <laughs> and this 12-year-old began to see it. He wasn't just like every other human being. <laughs> so at age 12, he figured out something some of us are still having a problem with. <laughs> He was not like everybody else. And this 12-year-old, studying it out, thinking it through, the scriptures were coming to him, he was seeing it more and more. When his parents left, he stayed there, didn't he? He did not want to get involved in their social activities. Now, there is a time for social things, yes, but there's also a time not to do it, and we need to sense that difference, too. He did not want to be with his relatives while they were laughing and joking and cutting up. He did not want to lose what he just learned. He wanted to, to get it, to absorb it, to make it part of his experience. And so he stayed, and you know the story. They found out <laughs> down the road he wasn't there anymore. What a shock! What a shock! God had put him in their care. This, this innocent child to take care of him. He's important. And now they don't even know where he is. <laughs> well, you know the story. Three days. They lost him. How quick did they lose him? How long did it take to get him back? Three days. That's something to think about. We can lose Jesus like that. Carelessness. Let our faith go someplace. It's not going to come back just like that. <laughs> All right. So Jesus then stayed there and talked to the lawyers and everything, the doctors of, uh, of the theology and he did something that to me was very interesting. They would ask questions, but their answers in their minds were theologically incorrect. And he saw they're not seeing what the scripture really says. And so he would raise his hand. It says, well, he says, you quoted Zephaniah so-and-so. What do you suppose Isaiah 45 means with that? And they'd think about it. How did he know that? <laughs> he wasn't a smarty. He didn't tell me. It says here. No, he, he asked him, what, what, is this, what do you suppose this means over here? And they couldn't believe that every time they said something that wasn't just right, he would take them to a scripture that would bring it back. You know what Jesus was doing? He was giving them their homework assignment for the next 18 years so that when they saw him next, they'd have a better idea of what he was doing. <laughs> a 12-year-old 
And you know, when Mary, I'm trying to abbreviate this so we get to the point of all this. When they finally came up to him, you know, she came up to him. After all, she was the mother. And she said, why did you do this to us? <laughs> Your father and me. And Jesus looked at her and said, no, he's not my father. My father. <laughs> now, he was not being sarcastic. He was just telling the truth. He said, don't you know, I must be about my father's business. Now, do you know why he said that? Have you, have you got behind the story to see what happened there with that 12-year-old? He saw his mission. It was to die for the human race. He saw it. And what he said to his father was, Yes, father, I will follow you. I will do what you say. I will move through the program with you. We will together save the human race. That was decided by a 12-year-old. A 12-year-old decided to save you. <laughs> so don't think it's too late to de decide big, important things. <laughs> You've already passed 12. <laughs> All right, Jesus went to the temple, to the sanctuary, to study out his mission. And that's where he learned who he was. So it seems to me that if we look at the sanctuary, we're going to learn some things about real salvation. So that's what we're going to do. We're beginning that program. Great Controversy 488 and 489. Well, you read 488 for yourself. That's going to lead me in too many places. You, you, read, you read that. I'm going to read 489. That keeps us in our subject. 489. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Now, there are not very many people who think that way. They have missed many features of the real plan of salvation. And we need to learn this thoroughly so we can share with people and try to get them to understand some things. You know, when Thomas Jefferson retired, he wrote a book on the life of Jesus. And his book ends when Jesus was on the cross. Would there be a plan of salvation if that's all Jesus did was died on the cross? What more does he have to do? <laughs> yeah, he has to be resurrected. You don't have a plan of salvation if everything happened at the cross. Do you see how simple that thought is? How many people ever arrive there? They say everything happened at the cross. Well, we would have no plan of salvation if Jesus died on the cross, and that's it. That's no more. No, he had to be resurrected. In Romans, the first chapter, it says God proved the power of the gospel by raising Christ. You have no plan of salvation without that resurrection. Jesus was not a ghost and went someplace when he died. He had to be resurrected. <laughs> now, when he was resurrected, what happened next? Did he just stay walking around on this earth? No. Yeah, the book of Hebrews says he went back to heaven. He went to the temple in heaven. 
He went where the Father was, and many people don't recognize that where the Father was either. He was in the holy place. He was in the sanctuary, Tahagia. So Jesus went, what did he go there for? Well, he went first to show the blood and asked the Father, is it sufficient? And the Father said, I accept that the plan was successful. And so Jesus said, you accept me in my work? The Father said, yes. He said, will you take my church with me? He said, yes. The, your church, your people are accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1.6. We are accepted because Jesus was accepted that day by the Father. We are not accepted by anything we do. We are accepted by that blood before the Father that day. What happened next? Well, now that we're accepted, Jesus says, when they received me, now we have to clean them up by the power of the blood. And the Father says, that we will do. You are the high priest. You function as a priest now in this sanctuary, and we will get the people ready to come home. Mm. And that's another part that's not understood today, the high priesthood of Jesus in heaven. What's he doing? All right. So there are some very important things here. What Jesus did at the cross, of course, can never be repeated. That's a once and for all act. It was a perfect sacrifice. And through the merits of that blood, now he can do the rest of it. But there has to be the rest. <laughs> I'm going to show you now how the sanctuary shows that in a picture form. Let's see here. I have to try to make a square of some sort here. These glasses don't help me. Here we go. Those are supposed to be squares. <laughs> okay, you see two squares. This is the courtyard. This is where everything in the sanctuary was. These, these were pillars with veils on them. It was a big wall, okay? And there was a gate at this end. We'll talk about that later. Now, the thing I want to point out right now is that there were two squares. This one represented earth. The one on the east side represented earth. I have to remember, people listen to this, you, they can't see what we're pointing to. <laughs> All right, the, the big square on the east side represented earth. The big square on the west side represents heaven. So we have two big squares here, one for earth and one for heaven. In the middle of earth square was another square, a little square. That's the altar of burnt offerings, that is the center of the plan of salvation on earth. Okay? The, plan, the center of the plan of salvation on earth in the heavenly square on the west side, in the middle of that was a square. It was actually a cube. And that was the center of the plan of salvation in heaven. So you see the picture that we've formed so far says God has two centers to the plan of salvation, one on earth and one in heaven. The one on earth is the cross. That's what the altar of burnt offerings represents, the cross of Christ. And the center of the plan of salvation in heaven is the most holy place with the ark inside of that. 
And we'll describe details as we go later. So now I would like to remind you of this statement in 489 Great Controversy. What Jesus accomplished by intercession in heaven is as essential as what he did at the cross. You can't have everything happening at the cross. You have to have a complete plan, what Jesus did on heaven, what, uh, on earth, and what he's doing in heaven. You have no plan of salvation if you don't have both those phases. And that's exactly what the sanctuary teaches thus far. So the object lesson that God made is really something very perfect. <laughs> as far as we've gone so far, we've gone beyond what most of the people believe today. Just in this one thing. All right, so let's continue here. In Exodus 25... Verses 1 and following. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. This is the offering which you shall take of them. Gold and silver and brass and blue, means blue cloth, <laughs> blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and that means white, fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood, oil for the light, and sweet incense, onyx stones, and st stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary. So now he just said what they're going to use, all these different elements. These are symbols that God said, I'm going to use to reveal who Jesus is. You bring these things. And then he says, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. Now, without reading the rest of Exodus, we need to understand why God said that. Why is he telling them, make me a little, a little house so I can live in your neighborhood. Why is God saying that? Well, this is after Exodus 20. <laughs> okay. God had given them the law. He had done the covenant with them. We've discussed the covenant that they sealed with bl the blood of animals. The people said what at that time? We'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll keep the covenant. We will keep your law. We will keep this agreement with you. Of course, they didn't do it. They broke the covenant right away. You know why they broke it? Because a lost person cannot keep the old covenant. No lost person can keep the old covenant. God never expected them to keep the old covenant. They can't and they couldn't. He knew it, but they didn't yet. <laughs> so he let them say, yes, we'll do it. <laughs> there is only one kind of a person that can keep the old covenant. That's a person who's not a sinner. The angels keep it who have never fallen. What is the old covenant? Can you say it in three words? Do you know it? Obey and live. That's the old covenant. And he made it with Israel, and Israel did not know they couldn't keep it. So they had to find out. Did we find out we couldn't keep it either? 
Yeah, we said, oh, I'll do that, Lord, I'll do that. He said, well, okay, you can talk just like you Zoom. Has anybody ever done it without Jesus? Not possible. Not possible. The angels in heaven who have never fallen obey and live. They keep the old covenant. So when the churches tell us the old covenant's no good, it was only for Israel and nobody can do it, well, they're kind of mixing the issues up. Because the new covenant was given then, Jeremiah 31, he says, I will put my laws in your heart. So that now under the terms of the new covenant, that is through Jesus' merits, through his power in you, you can obey and live. See? And we kind of mess it up too because we say, oh no, as long as I have faith, I don't have to obey. I'm sorry, folks. The issue is obedience. <laughs> don't think your faith is going to save you. That's what all the churches teach. Your faith earns nothing. <laughs> Desire of Ages, page 174. Your faith earns nothing. If my faith earned me something, what would that be? I could say to God, well, look at my faith, God. I earned salvation through my faith. That's a work. We cannot be justified by works. Only through what Jesus has done. So who is the legalist? The person who tries to obey God or the person who says my faith is going to save me? You see, these things get all twisted up. No, my works aren't going to save me, and my faith isn't going to save me. But Jesus working in me, that will save me. <laughs> it's, it's all Jesus. Okay, so verse 8 says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. They said, we'll do it. And immediately they broke the covenant because there's no way they could do it. And so God says, you didn't let me finish. <laughs> you did not let me finish. You can't do it. You never let me say it. So you got to learn it the hard way. He says, there's only one way. You can keep a covenant with me over the Ten Commandments, and that's to have a new heart. A new heart. And so Jesus says, I will come and live in you and give you the new heart. But they said, no, we don't want the new heart. We'll do it. <laughs> he said, well, you don't want the new heart? You don't want me to come and live in you? Oh, no. Moses, tell him to go away. We'll talk to you. Tell God to go away. And God said, what? <laughs> I've got to be in you. They said, no, we'll talk to Moses. <laughs> and so God said, well, if you won't let me in you, at least let me live in your neighborhood. Oh, you see how pathetic that is? God says, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in your midst. At least I'll be in your neighborhood. <laughs> Now, isn't that horrible? But that's what that eighth verse is saying. Make me a sanctuary. Make me a building, a tent, something where I can be, where you at least know I'm there. <laughs> okay, verse uh, 9. According to all that I show you, After the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments, right, even so shall you make it. So God just didn't tell Moses, go ahead and make me a temple. You figure out how to do it. No, God said, I want you to make it the way I show you. So God showed him a three-dimensional model. He showed him. He said, you make it just like this. 
Do you count the pillars? Do you see what they're made out of? Do you see how everything fits together? Do you see where the furniture goes? Do you see? Make it just like that. Now, if God is that particular, and he says to Moses, you do it just this way, it seems to me a little bit harsh for somebody to say, oh, you make too much of the sanctuary. Don't get involved in that stuff. Don't invent symbols. Don't. Hey, God is the one who's doing this. <laughs> and he is very particular. He told Moses to make it just like this 18 times. That seems to me there's something important in that when he says it. Do it just like this. Just like this. So when we look at this, if we're understanding it right, we will do it the way that God said so we don't get ourselves confused and mix up the symbols. Now, in this session, we're going to not go into details, even though the details are important. In Psalm 29, verse 9, it says in the margin of your Bibles, every whit declares the glory of God. That word whit means detail. Every detail, every little thing in there, the little pins, the, the dimensions of everything, the, the material that's made out of, every little thing is important. It declares the glory of God, the character of Jesus, what his mission is, what he's accomplishing. So there's nothing we can leave out. Everything is important. I've had theological friends tell me, oh, don't get into that subject. Well, you know, I have to because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm striving to be what God wants a Seventh-day Adventist to be. We are the people of the sanctuary. In Daniel 9, 17, Daniel said, Oh, God, we have a problem. We don't listen to your prophets. We don't pay attention to your laws. We don't obey. Oh, God, restore your sanctuary. He saw the answer. Restore the real plan of salvation to us. So that's why we're looking at this subject. And there are some new ones here. Uh, there was another young fellow here who wanted this. That's why we're doing this. I hope he shows up again. <laughs> He'll have to listen to the recordings. All right, so we have here then the basic structure of the outside walls. Now, I need to show you something more here before we leave today. Not only was this a cube, that's 10 cubits. There was another one in front of that. Another cube. And then there was another cube in front of that. But there was nothing in between, so it just looks like a long room. But you must not think of it as a long room and a little room. You must think of it the way God designed it. It's three cubes. <laughs> and all of it is in the heavenly side. <laughs> so that's in heaven. Now, I said the word cubit, so I need to try to define things as we go along here. In the literature that you're going to read today, I don't care where you get it from, it's going to tell you the cubit is 1.5 feet. That's the Egyptian cubit. But the cubit of the sanctuary is not an Egyptian cubit. In Ezekiel 43, verse 13 and 14, God tells Ezekiel to make the measurements based on a royal cubit. And in verse 14, it says what a royal cubit is. It's the regular cubit plus a hand's breadth, which comes out 1.8 instead of 1.5. So 10 cubits is 18 feet.
10 cubits is 18 feet. And again, I have discussed this with some very able people who teach this subject, who have disagreed with that understanding, and they say, no, it's 15. All of our books say 15. The commentary says 15. Uh, it is written, the material says 15. Everybody says 15. And I'll remind them, well, there's a source that doesn't say 15. And maybe we ought to look at that. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 347. Now, here we go, 347. The tabernacle was so constructed that it could be taken apart and borne with the Israelites in all their journeys. It was therefore small, being not more than 55 feet in length and 18 in breadth and height. Did you catch what she just said? It was 18 feet tall and 18 feet wide. That's a royal cubit. 10 cubits equals 18 feet. <laughs> and here's Ellen White telling us, under inspiration in just two sentences, what Ezekiel says in 43, 13. And it seems that people gloss over this kind of information. But that's what God says. It was 18 feet. So I, it doesn't really matter to me how many people say 15 feet. I have a sentence here that says 18 feet. <laughs> and this one came from God. <laughs> so we have a beginning point. 18 feet. We have a beginning place of reality. And to me, reality is most important. Reality is our modern word for truth. Truth is important to God. All right, so these 10 cubits, 18 feet, the wall was 9 cubits. I'm sorry, 5 cubits, 9 feet. Okay, now we got it. <laughs> 5 cubits, I better write it since I said that. 5 cubits, 9 feet. Okay. So these walls were made out of white linen. They were nine foot squ squares. The pillars were set up every nine feet. So you had these nine foot white squares. What does white represent? Righteousness and purity. Now when's the last time you jumped over nine feet by yourself? <laughs> Well, that's the lesson. None of us are equipped to get over those walls. Everything inside here is righteousness, and we can't even get in. <laughs> so when a person says, I'll do it, they haven't seen this yet. You can't get in. There's only one way in. It's over here at the east side, and we'll discuss that before we're done today. There's an entrance, but you can't get in any other way except that entrance. All right, so we have these nine-foot walls of white, purity and righteousness. You can't get in. They keep you out. Now, these walls, if you will visualize a big, flat place in the desert with nothing, they scraped it down to nothing. In Joshua, it says they scraped it down so that from the ark out in every direction was 2,000 cubits. 
That's two-thirds of a mile. So what you have here is a mile and a half of empty square. And in the middle of it is this little fence. <laughs> and inside of that is, is this tent sticking up. See, it's 18 feet, and these are only nine. So wherever you are, you can see that tent sticking up. And the outside covering, they had several coverings underneath there you couldn't see. But the outside one, the one you could see, was black. Looked just like black leather. And so here's the site you see. The tents of Israel are all around an empty square of a mile and a half. In the middle of that, this little white fence. And then inside of that, a black coffin. <laughs> yeah, that's what it looked like, a black casket. <laughs> and now you have a little picture of the, the camp of Israel. And so it's a strange sight. You know, every other religion, when they make something about their God, yeah, it's a statue of some sort. They make a, a bull or a goat or something. It's got horns, it's got tails. Or what, uh, all that, every God. But the, the God of Israel is represented here by a box. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? A box. <laughs> That's the center of the worship of Israel, that box. But as close as they can get is 2,000 cubits. Even when they marched, they were 2,000 cubits away from that ark. <laughs> now, your Bible says that that block covering was made out of badger skins. But that's not what the animal was. They had, out in the desert, at least in the environment where the lakes and seas were, an amphibious seal that lived both in the water and out of the water. And that's the animal they used. It was seal skin. It was not badger skin. And again, you'll get all kinds of flack if you say it to scholars, but that's exactly what it was, and that's what the Spirit of Prophecy says it was also. Seal skin. <laughs> so it doesn't matter where the scholars go. We have information that leads us to the right place, and I did not get my information from the Spirit of Prophecy. I had to dig in other places first. And, find these, and then, here's a sentence I can attach to. <laughs> it's beautiful the way God will back you up if you're doing your homework. So, we have then this block covering here, the seal skin, and we're starting to get a little more details of what's happening. We read some uh, other co colors. We'll get to those in a minute. Perhaps we should read Exodus 27, verse 9. Thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side, southward, there shall be hangings for the court of fine twined linen. There's where it says white, all this white, of a hundred cubits long for one side. So the tabernacle, the court rather, was a hundred cubits long. That would make it 180 feet. And this was 50 cubits long this side, so that would make that 90 feet. So now we know the dimensions, outer dimensions of the, the court, 100 cubits by 50 cubits, or 180 feet by 90 feet. 
Now these, these measurements will become important later because even the numbers mean something once you see where this goes. The, no, the uh, numbers of the furniture and so forth. Okay. Um, I said 60 pillars, so you'll have to work it out. 20, 20, 10, 10. The reason I say you have to work it out is because if you start uh, putting pillars down and drawing, you're never going to get to 60 because you don't know how to count like a Hebrew. <laughs> you can't put 20 down and 20 down and 10 down and 10 down and come out with 60. There's a special way of counting that we'll get to later to see why God does things a certain way. <laughs> okay, so... Um, The colors. In verse 16, it describes the gate colors of 20, uh, chapter 27. And those colors are blue, scarlet or red, purple, and white. So the color, colors of the gate here are specific colors for specific reasons. All right, let's go to Numbers 15, verse 38. We're going to look at the color blue to see if we can make out what these colors are doing. Verse 38, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. All right, so the Israelites, on the edge of their sleeve here, they had this little fringe of blue. And at the bottom of their robe, another fringe of blue. All right, so what does it say in verse 39? It shall be unto you for a fringe that when you look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them. <laughs> now, does God expect people to keep the Ten Commandments, or doesn't he? Well, only his children can do it. The rest of them say, we'll do it, and nothing ever happens. But according to my Bible, the law to get into heaven or to stay in heaven is still the same. Obey and live. And so it says here, Remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, that you may seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you use to go a whoring, that you may remember, verse 40, and do all my commandments and be holy unto your, your God. Did you ever notice that in the message to the Philadelphians in Revelation 3, 7, God introduces himself to the Philadelphians. What does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly, Brotherly love. That's God's true church. Anybody who says they're part of God's real church and don't know anything about brotherly love, they're not Philadelphians. They're Laodiceans. You can join God's church and be a Laodicean. But God is looking for Philadelphians. Did you ever notice how he introduces himself to the Philadelphians? He says, I am holy. 
He doesn't say that to any of the other churches. But he says it to the Philadelphians. I am holy and true. But what does that mean? What does he expect of the Philadelphians? <laughs> Sir. He said, you be holy, for I am holy. Now, he didn't say that to the Laodiceans. He only said it to the Philadelphians. Be holy unto your God. That's what it says here. Well, so what does the color blue mean? God says, put it here and put it here so that when you look there, you'll remember. When are you going to look there? <laughs> <laughs> when you're going to do something. <laughs> oh, I'm going to take that, whatever it is, and there's the commandments of God <laughs> around your hand. <laughs> and God says, you know, if you belong to me and you see those commandments there, that hand belongs to me, not to you. <laughs> you can't make that hand go outside of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> And the same with your feet. You can't go any place and get outside the Ten Commandments. They're all around you. <laughs> so God says, every time you look, you're going to see that fringe. Your mind. Obey through the Spirit of Christ. You belong to me. So the color blue means loyalty to God. It means obedience. So that's the first color we have in this gate here. It was all woven, blue and red threads and scarlet and white threads, all woven in there. That's the entrance way. And so the first part of that means obedience to God through love. What do you suppose red means? Okay, that's the color of blood, isn't it? It means our humanity. See? The life is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. So humanity is woven in here in obedience to God. When you take blue ink and red ink and you mix them together, what do you get? Yeah, you get purple ink. <laughs> okay, that's what the children learn in kindergarten. They, they make their colors and they mix them and they see what happens. So you got purple. So when you put this, this blue of obedience with the blood of sacrifice, a human obeying together, you come out with a royal priest. That's what Peter says, isn't it? He says you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation unto God. All right. So we've got those four, three colors, and the fourth one is white, and we already talked about that. That's righteousness, it's purity. It's, oh, by the way, what is righteousness? What does the word mean? Right doing. Righteousness is not an abstraction where you say, oh, it's this quality over here. No, it's right doing. <laughs> So when we have all of these colors put together, the blue of obedience, the red of humanity, the, the purple of royal priesthood, and we have total righteousness, what does that represent? It's only one thing it can represent. That's Jesus. There's never been another one like that. Jesus. And so God says, look at my object lesson here. Here's the white walls. You can't get in. They're too tall. If you want to get in here, the only place where there is righteousness, if you want to get into where God is, you have to start at this end and work your way here to the most holy place, the ark. But if you're going to get in at all, you have to come in through the entrance I have provided. You have to come in through Jesus. There is no other way to get in. So it seems to me that when people say what the Jews had has nothing to do with Christianity, I beg to differ. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
This is all about Jesus. This is the gospel. This is the real plan of salvation. So a person comes in here. The only way in, and remember it's on the east side. When you go into the sanctuary, you have to face west. <laughs> in the morning, you go in facing the west. What are you turning your back on? The sunrise. The sun. God's people are not to be worshiping the sun when it rises in the morning. You think about that next time there's an Easter sunrise service. God has something to say about that in Ezekiel the 8th chapter. He calls it an abomination. There is no reason why anybody who knows the Bible should be doing that. There are a lot of people being taken in by lovey-dovey ministers who don't teach them the Bible, but just teach them how to smile and be happy and sing songs and, and say, I believe. Well, what do they believe? They're not believing the Bible? The sanctuary teaches us very basic things here, just with a little bit we've seen so far, and it gets bigger as we get into the details. What a wonderful plan God has made. For your uh, notes, you might take down Exodus 26, 36. That describes the door of the tent we just talked about. All right, we talked briefly about the uh, tribes of Israel. I want to give you a little bit more here to round it out. This is all very basic, just to catch a picture here before we start the actual study. On the east side, there was a tribe with a flag. The tribes all had flags that had pictures on them. And when they marched, you just had to look at the flag and you knew who it was. On the east side, you saw a flag with a lion on it. <laughs> that was Judah. Okay, that's on the east side, the side of the entrance. And Isaiah, I won't tell you the scripture, it's over there in Isaiah 61, but you have to find it. <laughs> it says, enter through the gates called praise. Well, the word praise in Hebrew is Judah. <laughs> you enter through the east side. So if you know the sanctuary, you know that's what Isaiah was saying. He was using sanctuary language. And all of the prophets use sanctuary language. The 23rd Psalm. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Where did the enemies come from in the Bible? They always came from the same place symbolically. The north. The enemies of God always come from the north. It's the only way you can get there into the Palestine area. You can't go through the desert. You have to come around and come down from the north. And so God says, the enemies are in the north. I'll take care of that for you. I'll prepare a table for you in front of them so they can't get to you. They have to go through me first. Where was the table of showbread? The table of showbread was on the north side of the sanctuary. And so David says, as he comes in here through grace, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It's all sanctuary language. <laughs> but we have to know the sanctuary before we can understand these things. All right, so we'll, we'll uh, try to, to uh, move through this in such a way that things begin to really open up for us in terms of the sanctuary. So we have Judah, the lion, at the east side, that's Genesis 49, 9 for your notes. On the south side, we have Reuben. And the, the, the picture on his flag was a man. 
Amen. Deuteronomy 33, 6. On the west side, you have the tribe of Ephraim, and that was a bull, an ox. Genesis, and I'm sorry, uh, that's uh, Deuteronomy 33, verse 17. On the north side, the tribe of Dan. And that's kind of interesting to me because the word Dan means judge. He was a judge. <laughs> and his symbol was a snake. But they didn't like the snake, so they changed it to the eagle. <laughs> and an eagle is a snake killer. <laughs> that's Genesis 49, verse 17. We'll spend some time with these tribes and discussing these symbols and what they mean and why God used those symbols later. All right. So now you have the four tribes. Just as a teaser before we get there. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is the king. He's the lion. <laughs> Mark, he's the suffering servant, the ox. Luke, he's the perfect man. He grew in favor with men and God. See? The perfect man. The book of John, he's God, the eagle, heaven. <laughs> so the four Gospels are explaining the same parts of Jesus' mission as those symbols out there around the sanctuary. God is very consistent, but we have to understand what he's doing. <laughs> if we can pick it out one place, it will be the same someplace else. And so we see Jesus from these four different aspects. Uh, without getting to a study on it, Ezekiel saw this from a certain perspective. John saw it from a certain perspective. They saw four living creatures. Those four living creatures are not four living creatures. They are the ministry of Jesus. That's what he's supposed to be teaching us. Now, that ministry comes through us through two sources. His spirit and the angels. And so, have you ever been to a football game where people are sitting on the other side of the stadium and somebody gives a signal and everybody throws up a card? <laughs> what happens? Why are they doing that? You see a picture. <laughs> That's what I think John saw. He saw the angels throw up the picture of Jesus the lion. <laughs> Jesus, the perfect man. <laughs> but the angels were involved, see? All right. So as we look at this then, I'll, I'll give you just a few more things here. We have about 10 minutes. When the, you came in here with your little animal, and we'll d maybe finish with that today, there was somebody waiting here for you. On the north side, you came in through here. It was a priest. The priest would not let you in with your animal until he looked at the animal. <laughs> See? Now, why? Why didn't they just wait for you to get over in here someplace? It had to be right here at the entrance. The priest was looking for the word we don't like. Perfection. I know now you can buy it in a bottle. My daughter showed me a little bottle of cream that said perfection. <laughs> <laughs> the, the priest was looking to see that that animal was a fit representation of a substitute. See? And if the animal had a bent toe, you can't bring him in here. 
God's substitute does not have a bent toe. <laughs> and the priests knew all about this because they themselves could not be a priest if they had any kind of bodily disfigurement. They had to be perfect too. So if a man was born with a bent ear, you can't be a priest, I'm sorry. Well, anyhow, he came in with his animal here. Now, I won't tell you what the priests were doing in Jesus' time. Okay, so they come in with the animal, and they parked him over here at the north side. Which leads me to believe that this was a little bit to the south. Everything is symmetrical in here, but I've never seen anything that says it for certain. So you just kind of have to extrapolate. But anyhow, I do know that the animal sacrifice was done on the north side. All right. Between... There was a laver on the earth side between the altar and the sanctuary. This had water, this is blood. So there are two things involved on the earth side, water and blood. We'll get into that too. All right, when you came this way, you see these 18 feet boards sticking straight up. And those boards were shoulder to shoulder. They were held together at the top with, with a pin. What do you suppose that means? What do the boards represent? Well, a tree in the Bible is a symbol of a human. <laughs> and these boards were not made out of big trees. These boards were made out of little shittim bushes. And they would cut these down and trim them and glue them together and turn them into boards, 18-foot boards. <laughs> I can't imagine the work it took to make these things. They, they weighed almost 300 pounds once they were done. <laughs> That's because they had solid gold on the outside. But these boards were shoulder to shoulder, and they did not touch the ground. <laughs> so what, then they float? <laughs> no, <laughs> they did not touch the ground. Because humans are no good that touch the ground. They were on what the Bible calls tenons. They were little blocks of silver. And there were holes on the top, and the boards sat in those blocks of silver. The silver was on the ground, and the boards were on top of the silver. So the boards never touched the ground. The silver represents obedience. The only thing that is to attach Christians to this earth is obedience. <laughs> Now, this sanctuary is beginning to tell us things, isn't it? <laughs> and it's not very popular today for people to say these things in front of their churches. But this is God's plan of salvation. He has never changed. Those Hebrews should have known what Jesus was here for. But they misunderstood, they misapplied, they did not want to hear from God his way. They just wanted to go to church every Sabbath. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, there is no future in going to church every Sabbath <laughs> without doing it God's way. <laughs> and he has revealed his plan. That's why we're doing this. We want to get into all these details to show that he really opened this up to the Jews, to the Hebrews. They should have known. And many of them did. He had faithful people in all those centuries. And he has some today. They have yet to learn what this really means, but it's coming. All right, so we have a table of showbread here on the north side in the most holy place. On the other side, there was a lampstand with seven branches.
Now, everything out here in the earth side was made of, of wood and covered with brass. Brass is a symbol for suffering. That's the only way you can live on this earth is to suffer. <laughs> so don't try to get away from it. <laughs> don't think something went wrong if you're suffering. There are some people that think that God is pulled away because I'm suffering now. No, he's blessing you in a way you did. We're not being blessed before. <laughs> we better get used to that. He knows what we need. <laughs> okay? So suffering over here on this side. All you see is gold. And gold is a symbol of faith that works through love. <laughs> and so over here, something is different than what's over there. Here is how you become a Christian. And in the, the tabernacle is how you live as a Christian. There are two different things. You can only do it by faith because you're still living over here. <laughs> All right, this may be the last thing I can get in before the clock runs on me. In the middle square of the tabernacle itself. Now remember, the middle square. <coughs> was the golden altar with the points pointed to the four corners of the earth. Did you see how I drew that? You don't see that in most pictures. They make a square and next to the curtain. It was not that way. It was in the middle, pointing to the points of the compass. And you know the spirit of prophecy never misses. I have never seen the slightest deviation from no matter where it comes from, the sanctuary, the Bible, whatever the language is. In the spirit of prophecy, it says God's people t come to him from the east and the west and the north and the south. Well, where do you suppose they're meeting him? <laughs> At the place of prayer. That's the place of prayer through the righteousness of Christ, his incense. So I think we have a taste today of where we may be going in our study of what God has revealed in this object lesson. It's a fantastic, it looks so simple, that's all there is. But we will never exhaust what he built into this. <laughs> This really explains the plan of salvation, the one that we have today. It never shifted. They had the gospel before we had it. <laughs> Paul says, we receive the gospel as well as they. They had it first. What, is, what a shame it is for people to call the Jews a silly Weird race of people that never had a chance at the gospel of Christ because they were into works. No, there's only one salvation. It's in Jesus Christ. I mean, every church teaches that. Over there in Acts, there is only one name by which we shall be saved. That's Jesus Christ. Well, that means Noah. That means <laughs> Adam. That means Moses, Abraham. That means everybody who's going to be saved, it will only be through Jesus Christ. By the same process of receiving him through the faith that God gives us to help us develop and live our life. All right, we have a start. We'll see where we go now. This can branch off in lots of directions. But uh, if you have questions, Bring them, write them down on a little piece of paper, and we'll try to incorporate them as we go through to show that God has covered that base. <laughs> okay? All right, that's our prayer. Father, we thank you that you only know how to do perfection. And that means your plan is also perfect. 
Nothing has been left out of your plan of salvation. It takes in everybody. It takes in the weakest of the weak. And if today I consider myself to be that weak one, I'm covered. We thank you, Lord, that you don't know what failure is. You're going to get it done. Help us to realize, Lord, that when we look at ourselves, we're only looking at a mess. Help us to realize that the only salvation is Jesus. He is able. He's already proved it. You have accepted him. You have received him. You have accepted his work. It's a perfect work. When we come into him, we have all of that for ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that even though we become discouraged, and many times we look in the wrong direction. We look at ourselves instead of to you. You never cast us away. You have invested too much. You're going to see it through. We are going to be in your kingdom. We just need to be in a place where we are not rebelling, where we're not drawing away from you, that we're letting you work it out. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.